Hey. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Janelle Riley. Ooh, wow, and I can project. Uh, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the SAG After Act Foundation conversation with Helen Mirren. This is an actress who has done everything from Shakespeare to Saturday Night Live. She's conquered every medium with a Tony Award, an Academy Award, and four Emmy Awards to show for it. Uh, this year she is nominated for two SAG Awards for her work in Trumbo and The Woman in Gold. Please welcome Helen Mirren. Thank you. Thank you, rogues and vagabonds. <laughs> <laughs> That's what actors are, were always called in medieval England, and I always loved that. I think we are all rogues and vagabonds, really. Do you ever get tired of that? I mean, standing ovations must follow you everywhere you go. <laughs> Americans are always very, very generous and kind. <laughs> in England, it, it takes an awful lot to get them to stand up. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They do not stand up. Just not easily impressed? No. Or? Just a fire in the theatre. <laughs> Uh, well, this is a sag after audience, and so I always like to start by asking, and this, this might be strange since you began your career in England, but do you remember when you first got your SAG card? Yes, I do. I came to America to do a film called 2010, and um, it was my first sort of role in an American movie, and, uh, and that was when I got my first SAG card, so I was very, I'm very proud. I'm owner of SAG card ever since. You've done, you did so many movies before then, but that was the I first... I did, but they were all in yeah. Britain. They okay. were all British films, and um, obviously I was a member of the British Union. Um, in, in Britain, it's, it's, uh, it's one union covers both equity. Um, but, um, no, uh, so, anyway. Yeah, wow, 2010. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the movie, not the year. The movie, yeah. not the year, exactly. <laughs> but we got in 2010, then. it was like so far in the future, right. you couldn't really, like, imagine it. There was flying cars, <laughs> yeah, everything. Yeah. Uh, so I do want to go back and start at the beginning. Um, I know, I don't believe your family was in the business. Um, no, no, my family, um, n n no one in my family were. Well, in the um, in in the business of theatre or show business or film or anything at all. So, how yeah. did you first know you wanted to be an actor? Um, I knew I wanted to be a well. I, I I saw a very bad production of Hamlet when I was about fourteen. <laughs> it was an amateur production, so it, you know it co couldn't have been very good. But it um, maybe I was thir twelve or thirteen, and it uh, just the story of it really mm. trans. Tr absolutely transfixed me. Um, uh, you know, I don't think I'd ever seen or read Hamlet. So, can you imagine watching that play when you, you don't know that Ophelia goes mad? <laughs> you don't know that Hamlet's going to die. You know, you literally you can watch it as a, as a thriller, uh, purely as a thriller. Um, so that was an, in, an absolutely seminal experience for me. But I actually thinking about that, I, I came from the equivalent of um, Coney Island, you know. <laughs> My hometown was sort of like the British equivalent of Coney Island. It was a, um, a, a place, they called it on sea, but actually it was on the Thames estuary, so it wasn't really on sea at all. But um, it was where the working class people of London would go uh, for their, you know, at the, at the weekend for a Saturday night, they'd go to get drunk and have a fight. and. <laughs> throw up and go home and say, oh, that was a great night. <laughs> oh, I had a, I had a blast. Um, but um, they, they had the longest pier in the world in South End on Sea, longer than any pier in America. It was literally the longest pier in the, in the world. And at the end of the pier, they would have shows. And I do remember my parents taking me to see a show at the end of the pier when I must have been about five. And again, being just transported by the magic of what was happening on stage, which was a variety show with comedians and dancers and stuff like that. But I remember being absolutely mesmerized by it. And uh, I'm curious about this bad production of Hamlet only <laughs> because I love that, you know, it, it, it shone through even though the, the show wasn't good, that Shakespeare was so powerful. I d uh, yeah, Shakespeare definitely, but storytelling, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, the, and the ability of what we do to transport people in, the, in their imaginations. I, I think it was that that was uh, the quality of the production, or even the fact that it was Shakespeare, I think in a way was kind of immaterial. Yeah. I think that wonderful gift that we've all been given to be able to work 
in an art form that has that ability to completely transport people at, at the moment of them watching it. It's a magical thing, isn't it, really, yeah. that, that people can sit in a theatre or in a cinema and they know that you're not that character, obviously, clearly, you know, but they're, they're willing to engage that moment of, of, of suspension of disbelief and be carried through on the story and cry when it's sad and laugh when it's funny and be entertained, be moved, be educated, be all of the things that we can do when we do our jobs. Um, what an amazingly wonderful thing to be able to do that is, you know? And um, I believe you first got involved with the National Youth Theatre? I did. That was, sort of my, that, that was my ticket into the profession, coming from a world, and I'm sure many of you sitting here have had the same experience. It's, it is like a, you know, like the Wizard of Oz. It's like the, the golden city, isn't it, that you, you want to be a part of, and, and you just don't know how to get there. You just, I, how do I get there? You know, if you have no... Um, family who can or, or there just seems to be nowhere to get no ability to get there especially if you know you you don't come from a very um, strong economic background and I didn't you know I was sort of you know my parents were not remotely wealthy or even well off um, so um, you know it seemed an, an, an impossible an impossibility but there was this organization in Britain called the National Youth Theatre and they would take young people uh, who couldn't afford to go to drama school I never went to drama school you know that was impossible um, and and kids from all kinds of backgrounds and and we would do a Shakespeare play every every in the summer holidays and that was my absolutely my ticket into the professional world because it, it gave me a a, a space for people to be able to see my work, which is so incredibly important for us, isn't it? Um, and 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 I'll mention right here that I'm a I'm a great supporter of the. Um, I'm sure many of you are members of Equity as well, but um, of of the um, initiative to keep the small theatres open. Um, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in unions and, and in uh, working, good working practices and people being paid properly for their, for their efforts and for their work. But I think here in Los Angeles, it's a very specific sort of environment. And I think it's so important for actors to be able to have the venue to present their work in, in this town in particular. So um, I, I think that's very important. Because it's all about being seen. It's, it's all about being seen, absolutely. And, you know, uh, it, it, it's so hard to, um, to put yourself up there in, in front when there are so many other people putting themselves up there. It's very, very difficult. And it's impossible to show how people how great you are until you can show them how great you are, you know. And did your work with them lead directly to the Royal Shakespeare Company? Uh, yes, it did. Wow. Yes, it did, absolutely. Um, I got an agent from that. Um, it, it, you know, it was great. It, it, uh, it was absolutely great. And, and um, I trained as a teacher, actually. I trained really? for three years as a teacher. I never trained as an actress. But, uh, but as soon as I left my college, I went straight into the profession. Um, it, it, into the Royal Shakespeare Company, basically, yeah. So, I mean, you've never had any formal training, or did you? No, uh, no, no, my training was sort of on the, on the hoof, as it is for most of us, really. Yeah. Because even if you do go to drama school, um, it can never compare, really, to what you face in, in the real world, mm -hmm. does it? I mean, it's, it's completely different. So we all learn on the job, actually. Um, and that's sort of another thing I love about my profession is that we're all in the same boat. We really are, uh, you know. Um, we're all uh, sharing the same space and, and telling the story together. I, I'm a great believer in, in that. Um, and, and we all learn on the job. Mm -hmm. That's what we all do. We actually have an audience question about that. Um, again, I apologize if I mis mispronounce anyone's name, but I think it's uh, Hosea Blount? Hosea? Blount? Hosea? Josiah. 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 Sorry, Josiah. You've got to write the third time. Yeah. <laughs> um, wants to know what training has been most beneficial to your craft, formal or on the job? Um, 
I mean, for pure training, especially for the theatre, vocal training is very important. Um, very often you do that, you train your voice on the job because, because, because of doing eight shows a week and, and you know, you have to, um, you have to have a, a vocal uh, ability that can carry you through that. Um, so if you're going to do a lot of theatre, obviously uh, vocal training is very, very important. Um, uh, for film, I, d I don't know, you know, film is such a very different thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, um, you're s it? It's so much more to do with who you are on film and uh, the, the, the parts of yourself that you can't control, you know nothing about. I would say we're, we're su simultaneously two people. We, all of us, we are the person we know ourselves to be within ourselves and carrying, you know, seeing life through our eyes and carrying on down our path. But we are the person that the world sees. And that's a person we never see. Mm. Sometimes we get a glimpse of it on the screen, a glimpse of what other people see. But in reality, there, we're carrying this other person with us, alongside of us who we will never meet and never really get to know. And, and that's the, the us, the, the, the you that, know, <laughs> that, that, that the rest of the world sees, that I see when I sit here and look at you. Um, you will never see that person. It, it's so fascinating. Um, but anyway, so I say film is, um, film is, a, uh, is a different animal. And, and, uh, and it's so much to do with the the intrinsic nature of who you are in the most sort of in the deepest sort of way. Um, I was very intimidated by film when I first started doing film. I just didn't know what I didn't know what all these cables were and the lights <laughs> and the <laughs> where's the where's yeah. the camera? Like where what does it look like? What does the camera look like? And and um, I, I just I didn't know what I was doing. I, I, call, I called it rabbit in the headlights acting, you know, <laughs> turnover action. <laughs> but, you know, is, it, is it time to speak now? You know, like cut. What, what, what? Um, <laughs> terrible. Um, and uh, I went through, and then I, d I was cast in Mosquito Coast with Harrison mm. Ford. And, um, and God, that was like the greatest day of my life when I got the call to say I got that job, you know, with Harrison. You know, it's like, oh, that's it. You know, it's like, this is it. My life is, from here on in, is going to be fantastic. Um, <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was so excited. I was so over the moon. Um, and Harrison, as I'm, I'm sure many of you know, you've probably met him and know him, but he's, a, he's the kindest very generous actor to act, work with, just really lovely. And he so knew what he was doing, you know, he's such a professional, the, the, just the archetypal profession, professional on the set, understands the camera, the lens, the everything, you know, the frame, um, and I knew nothing, I was completely ignorant. And, and I thought I'd use the experience to try and free myself up in front of the camera, because freedom is what it's all about, isn't it? It's, it's that ability to be free in front of the camera. That's why I've always said my inspirations for acting are babies and dogs, you know, <laughs> on, on, on camera. Yeah. Because they are <coughs> mesmerizing. Yeah. You can't take your eyes off them, can you? Because they're so in the moment, mm -hmm. as they say, as we say. And, um, and, and that's, it's the endless battle to get to that point where you are as free as a baby mm -hmm. or a dog. Um, but um, <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, so I, I used Mosquito Coast as a sort of a, an exercise, really, to try and free myself up. And I thought I will just be unconscious of the camera. I will just be in my character. I won't, ca uh, in the space, we, we shot it in Belize, so we were in the jungle anyway, so it was wonderfully sort of vis visceral environment. Um, I would just, and poor Peter, <laughs> Peter Weir, who was directing, I drove him crazy because he said, Helen, get in the shot! <laughs> Helen, you're not in the shot! Go over there! <laughs> there, you're in the shot! 
I'm sort of busy acting away over here. Yeah. <laughs> Doing great stuff, I'm sure. Doing yes. brilliant, yeah. brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> Nobody could see it. <laughs> So uh, it took me a while to learn that, but, but it was a good process. It, it did help me to sort of free myself up. And then, and then I did um, many, you know, a lot of Prime Suspect mm. on television. And, <laughs> and, um, and, th and that was the thing that made me learn about the technique of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. I, I, and that was absolutely invaluable. And, and I started, and I still do now on film sets. I hang around the camera, you know, listening uh, <laughs> uh, at what the director is saying yeah. to the cameraman, um, just to uh, understand what the shot is, you know, what the rhythm of the shot is. Where is it going to be a dolly shot? What, what? In other words, learning the technique of filmmaking, and I think that is very, very valuable, um, actually. I mean, film's such a weird thing, isn't it? it it's, it's this balance between utter naturalism, freedom, uh, and this heavy, ponderous thing called <laughs> filmmaking with the cables and the lights and the, and the camera. It's all a little bit lighter than it used to be, but still, it's, it's very ponderous, the whole thing. So you've got this extraordinary balance to try and get on film and and so I'm always blown away when I when I see a film that I feel has <laughs> sort of magically made you forget the ponderous nature of filmmaking and I think Joy for example this year was a film that I I felt did that you know you you some films you're very aware of the filmmaking it's very beautiful but you're kind of aware of it it's formal and you know, presented and, and can be utterly gorgeous. But I love it when you have that feeling of slight random wildness in a film. Um, I'm, it's strange to hear you say that it wasn't until The Mosquito Coast because you had done some big movies. Before that, you'd done Caligula and... Yes, true, true. <laughs> <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta tell us about that. <laughs> true. What's that set like? I think that was great because... Uh, um, uh, he had this way of filmmaking. He'd set the shot up almost like you're in the theatre. So obviously, uh, I was used to that. Um, and we'd all be like up here on a sort of a stage in various states of undress. Um, uh, and uh, and then there'd be a bank of cameras, one, two, three, four cameras, like miles and miles away. What you didn't know that one of those cameras was in extreme close-up wow. and was moving from one person to another, catching big close-ups like this, but the camera was an awfully long way away. One camera was g getting the wide, then there'd be another camera, usually roaming as well, get it picking up two shots. So you'd play it through like a, like a theatre piece. So th that was an interesting um, way of, uh, of filming. But Excalibur too, I mean, you had done that, you had yes, done Long Good Friday. Yes, but as I say, yes, oh. yes, <laughs> but, but in Excalibur we were all uh, so ignorant about <laughs> filmmaking. <laughs> I mean, Liam Neeson, me, Gabriel Byrne, you know, people who went on to have very illustrious mm. film careers, all of us complete ignoramuses. <laughs> and poor uh, John Borman, you know, he, he must have just tearing his hair out, you know. I remember we were, this is, was an example, we rehearsed a scene, a scene where I, you know, I was sort of doing important stuff in the scene. So we rehearsed it, and he said, maybe if you come down from here, uh, Helen, and and uh, and then you do a bit here, and then you go over there, and you you know how you rehearse it. So we rehearsed it, and um, and he said, okay, we're going to set the cameras up, um, and I went away. And now I'm in my trailer. I'm thinking, oh. No, I'm, I'm not going to do that. that. No, I'm not going to do that. That's wrong. <laughs> that, I shouldn't know. I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something. I'm going to do this. So I come back after two or three hours. They call me on the set. And I say to John, John, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to do that anymore. Because <laughs> oh <my laughs> I didn't understand about setting up cameras yeah. Yeah. and lights. I had no idea. You know, I just hadn't thought that, that you can't change it because it means you've got to completely change the setup. <laughs> So he was, you know. Yeah, how'd he take that? Uh, he said, no, you're doing it like that because that's what the setup is. I mean, did you find, though, that um, particularly Excalibur, but also The Long Good Friday, which was, you know, a hugely acclaimed movie, did that sort of open doors for you in Hollywood? 
Did we come calling? Um, I, uh, Long Good Friday, yes, that did get attention here in America. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know what it was uh, that uh, made me suddenly... Um, it, now, trying to think of it, I became... America's Russian actress for a while, and I'm trying to <laughs> quite remember why that was. I did 2010, that's when my husband asked me to do White Nights. I think I won, I think it was winning, uh, no, I think it was winning a, um, I, I won the Cannes Best Film a uh, Actress Award um, for a film I did called Cal. Mm. Very good movie. By then I was beginning, yeah. beginning to learn. It takes a long time, doesn't it, really? you know, to, to re really learn and understand the process. Did me anyway, I mean, it took me a long time. Um, I, I think it was winning Best Act Actress at Cannes, and then from that I was asked to do 2010, and then from that I was asked to do my husband's film, White Nights, and then sort of, and then whatever happened, happened after that. But and certainly prime, sus prime suspect right. was very important. But yes, you're right. I'd done a l I'd done a lot of television in England, and I'd done and I'd done quite a few movies. Yeah. Well, we have to talk about Prime Suspect because for not only because it's awesome, but I mean you started with that character in 1991, and I believe the last one aired in 2006. Probably, yeah. So you spent yeah. 15 years with Jane. I did, but you know it was a great gig because. Um, it wasn't like uh, like you shoot that sort of series here. I would do one four-hour story and then not do it again for 18 months, go off and do theater, do films, do lots of other things. And then about every um, two, two, or two years or something, um, then I'd come back and do another four-hour story. So um, it was wonderful like that. So yes, it was over that length of time, but in between, I did loads and loads of other things, yeah. Was there, because back then, at least in America, there was sort of a bias against TV that you either did TV or you did yes, film. Yes, uh, yeah, do both. Isn't it, and how, isn't it great yes. that that's changed? <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. I think it's, it's so, and it, it's TV that has shown the way, that has led the, led the charge so brilliantly. I mean, it, all, it always used to be for female actors that your best roles were on television. They, they just always were, especially, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, but the, you were given far more interesting opportunities, uh, opportunities on television than you were in, in film. Even if you're a big movie star, it, it was just the kinds of roles that were be being written for women um, in general were just really boring, basically, very boring. And, <laughs> one-dimensional and to find the um, the interesting complex characters you had to go to television. So was there any hesitation about doing TV because you were in the middle of a thriving film career? No, it, it, you know that that prejudice didn't exist in England. Good. No, because you guys were ahead of us. Uh, no, <laughs> it wasn't that. I think it's because our film industry was so awful. <laughs> <laughs> it was dreadful. And um, I always used to say, it used to be that British film is alive and well and living on television because <laughs> the, the writers, the directors, the actors, um, and a lot of your, you know, the people who subsequently became extremely successful Hollywood directors started on British television. Mm, that's right. Brit British uh, directors. British-born directors. So it, it was true. And the kind of work we were doing on... I mean, I did, for example, a, a piece called Blue Remembered Hills, which is by a great writer called Dennis Potter. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. But um, that was the kind of piece that... Uh, it was experimental in the sense that we were all in our 30s and 40s, but we were playing seven-year-old children. Wow. And it was about seven-year-old children and what happens in their little world, and it all played by adults. So, you know, it was an amazing piece, and it was all on film. It was fantastic. Um, but, but that was this kind of work that, that was being done on British television, um, which you wouldn't have a hope in hell of ever doing <laughs> you know, on, on, in, in movies. So you literally got to play a child because literally, children yes, are... Yes, a seven-year-old, yes, yes. Have you yeah. ever played a dog? 
Because once you've played a baby no, and a dog, I'd love, to play a dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to do the research on playing the dog. It was fun doing the research on playing a seven-year-old. <laughs> uh, that, of course, brings us to another one of your iconic roles, since we're talking about them, playing Queen Elizabeth II in the 2006 film, The Queen. Um, again, how did this project come to you? Because it, like, on paper or just hearing about it, it feels like it could have gone so wrong. Yes. And instead is this beautiful character study and so complex and like, you know, someone who I never thought that I would have huge feelings of sympathy for, <laughs> I find myself caring about. Well, we're all humans, aren't we? That's the thing. Um, it came about, I was doing the last Prime Suspect and um, it, it was the first day of the read-through. And on, the, or on those days with Prime Suspect, I, w I would always make sure that I was the first person before any of the other actors arrived so I could sort of welcome people and make them feel like they're a part of a, t a team and a group, you know. So um, I, was, I was doing this and, and our producer, um, Andy Harris, was at the other end of the room kind of watching this process going on. And, and he said, and he was thinking, oh, that's so funny. That, you know, they're, tr they're treating her as if she's the queen. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then he looked at me in profile, you know, and said, oh, she looks a bit like the queen, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and there, in his mind, was born the idea of making a movie about wow. the queen. And so um, the idea was presented to me. And, you know, the British have a weird love-hate relationship with the royal family. <laughs> They kind of adore them, but they want to rip them down yeah. all the time. It's a very weird, dysfunctional relationship. And, um, and I, I said, yes, I'm interested, but only I will have to read the, the script because I don't want to be a part of something that is mean, mean and, and unfairly attacking or satirical or, you know, just mean-spirited. Um, so they, they went away and, and the script got read, uh, written, and I thought it was wonderful. Mm. So with great trepidation and fear, I signed up for it, because in, in um, Britain, you know, the royal family, as I say, flies on shit, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh, you know, the press, the, every, the, you know, the attention is so intense. And I believe you have met the Queen, but it was before you shot the movie. Yes, I had met the Queen before I shot the movie. Yes, I did. Yes. Br very briefly, in, a, in a, me and Chloe Sauvigny, actually, <laughs> I went to meet <laughs> the Queen random. together. <laughs> exactly, the two of us, in a sort of tea party. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a big tea party with like 300 people there, not, <laughs> not me and the Queen and Chloe Sauvigny. It wasn't like that. <laughs> I want to see that movie, yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was just a brief introduction? Just very brief, yes. yes, absolutely. But did you draw on that when you were preparing? to play her? Um, I did a little tiny bit. Really? It, it is what everyone says. It's, there's something very twinkly about the Queen. You know, you see this rather, you know, that sort of, you know, not serious face. But actually when she's doing her, her job and she's acting, she's acting the Queen, actually, is what she's doing. Do you know what I mean? Um, she's very twinkly and very... Um, you know, there's a nice little thing going on there, and I really wanted to bring that into my um, uh, 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 characterization of her. Um, it was difficult to do because it was a, it was a dark story, so mm. there wasn't a lot of moments to, to bring that in, but I, I wanted to bring that in. I mean, and you've played real people before, and, and since the Queen, obviously. Um, do you, is your, does your research process differ because you have so many real things well, you have drawn? a research. You don't yeah. have a research with... I mean, with obviously, you know, imaginative characters, you have to, you know, maybe look at well, what are they? They're a teacher. Okay, I research, I research what being a teacher is. But you know, the brilliant thing about playing a real life character is there's your backstory. <laughs> You've got like the best, the deepest, the most complex backstory you can possibly imagine. The downside is that you'll never be as good as they are <laughs> at being them, you know. Uh, so you'll only ever be, if you're lucky, 65% as good as they are, you know. Uh, but you have to, you know, accept that. And then you played her again last year on Broadway. On Broadway, uh, yeah. And before that, I should say, mm. in, in England, in mm. the audience. Uh, for which you won a Tony, I should mention. Yes, <laughs> thank you. It was, a, thank you. it was a very different piece. Very different. Very, very yeah. different. In, uh, the play went from 
um, it was it was her just talking to her prime ministers, and and it went from um, for, for her whole life, you know, from twenty six to eighty five, whatever she is now. Um, so one had to do this, that, that span of age, but also it, it went randomly. You know, you started off at, at um, uh, in your 50s, and then the next scene you're in your 26, and then the next scene you're in your 80s, and the next scene you're back being 50 again. And so you went backwards and forwards like this, but with these amazing quick changes, it, it, was, it was great. I mean, was there any hesitation in, in revisiting a role um, that was oh, so yes. iconic yes. with the same writer, no less? Yes, absolutely. Because, you know, it doesn't matter how many things, different things you do, sometimes certain roles get, you know, put on your shoulders and, and, um, and you, you never really quite wriggle them off. Um, for a long while, it was Jane Tennyson. You know, I was uh, I knew if I'd be knocked over by a bus, you know, Jane Tennyson <laughs> dies. Um, <laughs> they can't now say the Queen dies, but um, Helen Mirren, famous for playing the Queen, dies. So you know, uh, I, it for me, it's fun. My, mm -hmm. The fun of my job is is to investigate all these different worlds that you get the chance of of. Um, of investigating and, and imaginatively putting yourself into. So I want that world to constantly change. Have you ever gotten any feedback on, you know, what she thinks? Because I've heard things, un, you know, that aren't official, but that she really liked the movie, and I, I have to think there's a part of her <laughs> that's, that's very unofficial. <laughs> that's very, very, very unofficial. I, even I don't know that, honestly. Um, but I was invited I couldn't go, unfortunately, but I was invited to dinner with my husband um, uh, about six months, a year after the film came out, to, to dinner, uh, you know, a big dinner with uh, lots of other people, but I don't think I would ever have been invited if they'd hated it. Exactly. Um, and then again, uh, the Queen very kindly invited me to tea, only this time it was a tea with only about six other people. Was Chloe any one of them? No, Chloe didn't make the cut this time. <laughs> no, okay. Chloe wasn't one. No, it wasn't. You know, I was the only. It was God. It was so, it was so, in, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so embarrassing. I was more mortified. But they very kindly invited me. So I think that was a little sign of of um, approbation. Is that the yeah. right word? Yes. Uh, you weren't able to go, or are you? There's a probium, isn't there, which is <laughs> bad, isn't it? An approbation, which is good. Am I right? I think so. Yes, yeah. right. <laughs> Were you able to go or? Yes, I went. Oh, okay. Oh, no, no, I went, absolutely. I was sitting next to um, the Duke of Edinburgh. I was just sitting in between the Duke of Edinburgh. Oh, no, the Queen wasn't sitting next to me. The Sheikh of Bahrain was sitting next to me. <laughs> As you do. As you do. I, or Sheikh of somewhere, Qatar, some, some <laughs> Sheikh. <or whatever>. Um, <laughs> and then the Queen was sitting on the other side of the Sheikh. He was there because he was a big horsey guy. It was a big, it was an ascot, so it was wow. a big horsey thing. And I know nothing about horses. I'm not a horsey person. Um, <laughs> the Duke of Edinburgh had been rather cruelly treated in the movie, so I'm, mm, I'm right. just like, oh God, I hope he doesn't mention the movie. And um, it was tea, you know, sandwiches, and. I had my tea, and the, the milk was over there across the Duke of Edinburgh. <laughs> and my, the whole, I don't really remember anything about the tea or what anyone said, except all I could think of was how do I get the milk <laughs> to put into my tea? Is it all right to ask the Duke of, uh, yeah. Duke of Edinburgh to pass the milk? And then I went into a complete funk. What do I call him? If I asked to him to pass the milk, do I call him sir? Do, do, do I call him your highness? Do you, what do I call him? What do I, I, can't, I, I can't remember what I'm supposed to call him. And then, or do I wait for a, a, a footman to come and get the milk? So anyway, I, all I could think of was the milk. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and we, we sort of used that in the play of the audience yes. with one of the, um, one of the prime ministers, oh, that's you hilarious. know, not knowing what to do with the milk and the sugar tongs and stuff like that. 
I have to think on some degree, the queen has to just be like, yeah, Helen Mirren. <laughs> like, yeah. There were some great cartoons at that time, very, very funny cartoons in the newspapers. They, they, they were great. It was a collection of very funny ones. Uh, something I love is, uh, I mean, you'd done action films before, but you kind of became an action star after winning the Oscar with movies yes. like Red and National yeah. Treasure. Yes, yeah, so, because that's the thing, fine, you know, going into it. And, and I think probably winning the Oscar did give me the opportunity to do that, to, to do that, uh, you know, Red. Uh, they probably wouldn't have thought of me otherwise. Um, but isn't that the fun of it, that you can go from one, you know, yeah. from one extreme to the other? So I was very happy and excited to be in Red, yeah. And do you treat that as seriously as Shakespeare? I mean, all, all your roles? Well, it's funny, you know, watching people like Bruce Willis, um, who are such masters at that kind of um, acting. It's so different from, you know, a lot of the work that I've done. And, and, I, and I really, really studied Bruce, you know. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? It doesn't look like you're doing anything. What is it you're doing? You know, you have to be this close to him. And then on the screen, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I always try to learn. There's always some, you know, there's always such a lot to learn. And I learn from everyone. I learn from young actors, people. You know, when you're working with a young actor, um, you learn as much from them as you do from the uh, I experienced actors. Uh, which brings us to this year, in which you have not one, but two incredible roles, uh, Woman in Gold and, of course, Trumbo. Um, yeah. Uh, I want to start with Woman in Gold because Maria Altman is, is she's such an amazing woman and again playing a real life person. Uh, how did that story find its way to you and, and, and how did you go about preparing to play her? It came in the normal way of, of a script, an idea, a script. Um, and I didn't know anything about that story. So it, it was a revelation to me as well. I thought, how did I n never read about this? This is fantastic. And then, of course, I had the great um, pleasure of finding out, as I started the research, that Maria was such an extraordinary character, a you know, wonderful character to play, with a natural wit and um, uh, energy and fierceness um, th that was really, really a treat, you know. It's lovely to find out that you're the person you've committed to play, you actually kind of fall in love with, and, and I did with Maria Altman. Sadly, because she wasn't a celebrity or anything, there was very little film of her, mm. and uh, I would have loved to have had more film to watch. Um, uh, you know, it's fascinating, you know, you, you watch, uh, fir you know, first you watch the, okay, what color are her eyes, what's her hair like, you know, how does she use her hands, how does she sit, what's her demeanor, and then you start digging a little deeper and a little deeper. And, and I notice, for example, with the, the Queen, you know, she's always so um, calm and everything's physically controlled and contained and disciplined, incredibly disciplined. She never leans back in a chair. She's always forward like this. Uh, never like this, always <laughs> like this, you know, like that. Um, but Sometimes she's like this. She's sitting very quietly, but she's doing this. And there's this beat going on inside yeah. of her, this fast beat. And this weird, you know, wonderful contradiction between the calm outside and this inner beat that's going like this. So, you, you know, you, you look at little things like that. And with Maria Altman, I, I watched a, a long deposition. She doesn't say anything. She's just listening. But the quality of her listening is so strong, so, so powerful. And the anger and the passion inside of her, again, rather like the Queen, not particularly shown. And a lot of it is in profile, but you just, you just feel it mm. so strongly. Um, and very, very impressive. Um, so I would so try to get that into Maria. And, and I thought the only way to do that is because I, I, I don't have her memories. That's not a part of my life. So I had to 
recreate her memories and put them into my mind. So uh, uh, really the most of the research, the, the work for Maria was that process of reading, revisiting Holocaust material, rereading the history of what happened in Vienna in those days, looking at that film, not looking at film of Maria, looking at the film of what she witnessed as a, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old and putting that firmly in my mind as the overriding um, presence in my mind. So in every shot uh, with Maria in that movie, didn't matter if she was being funny, I felt that had to be in her head all the time. Um, kind of on the opposite end of this remarkable and controlled woman is Hedda Hopper yeah, <laughs> in yeah, Trumbo. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Although, is it wrong that I kind of love her? I mean, she no, just... No, I don't <laughs> think it's wrong because she's so... Especially the world that she came yeah. out of, you know, and what she made for herself. The incredible, one single-minded sort of ambition and and strength of character that forced her way through mm -hmm. into that. You know, there's something admirable about that. And she was, and the other thing about Hedda was she genuinely, I think, you know, it's difficult for me I, I, uh, because, you know, I watch, because but there are Hedda Hoppers out there, aren't there? People, Anne Coulter maybe comes to mind, <laughs> someone like that. But, you know, they have a, but I, I know Anne Coulter has described herself as a comedian, hasn't she? Interesting. As a, in other words, that's a kind of a performance she does. I, you know, to me, what a weird thing to choose. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, it's her... I think she kind of believes it all, but as a, uh, also it's a performance that makes her money and gives her, brings her fame and celebrity, and, and it's her... Uh, you know, and it's her, um, what's the word, um, job, mm -hmm. you know, her profession, what's the word, I can't think of the right word, but, um, and I, I, I wonder if there was a bit of Hedda in that, but, but I do think Hedda genuinely saw herself as an absolute American patriot and loved America and uh, loved the red, white and the blue of America and uh, was passionately committed to that. You know, she was a complex, interesting yeah. character, and I'd love to know more about her, actually. I mean, it is such a fascinating story. Did you know much about the Hollywood blacklist? I did know, yes. Yeah. I knew quite a bit about it. Um, uh, n not, I actually did, d hadn't quite understood that Dalton, actually, and many of them went to prison. That was the thing that shocked me, too. I didn't. I yeah. w for some reason, I hadn't been aware. That I knew that they'd been blacklisted. They weren't allowed to... to um, work. In fact, in Britain, we were the beneficia beneficiaries of that because a couple of the blacklisted, wonderful blacklisted directors came to England to work, Joe Losey being one of them, and, and became, you know, one of the real stars of, of, um, of the good side of mm -hmm. British film. Um, there was a little bit of it, and it was both mostly around Joe Losey. Yeah. Um, just plain Hedda Hopper, did you keep any of her hats or costumes? <laughs> I would have to. <laughs> I would I have wish. to. <laughs> I know Daniel did a great job with costuming. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Um, I, I, I'll have to ask if I can have one of those hats <laughs> back. Yeah. And did you ever feel bad being so mean to Brian Cranston? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because as you know, he's one of the kindest, yes. best-hearted men in, in our business. I mean, I know it's acting, but sometimes do you ever, like, after they yell cut, just be like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I said, uh, was that bad enough or should I be worse? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do want to take a couple more questions from the audience. Um, I have one from Michaela Hughes, I think, hopefully I got that right. Um, what is your process when approaching a character, inside out or outside in, what seems to come first? And have you had a part that's kicked your butt and you didn't think you'd find it? <laughs> yes, yes, I have had a couple of those. Um, uh, when I felt so out of my depth, not necessarily for the character, but yes, for the character and also the, just the whole movie and the environment and... Um, but um, outside in or inside out, well, you know, the outside is important and I, I love the process of finding 
the hair and the and the um, makeup and and the costuming. It was funny with Hedda Hopper. It was all about the eyebrows, <laughs> all about the eyebrows. And I really looked at her and watched her, and I realised she had the eyebrows, weird eyebrows that sort of start here and go like this. <laughs> so we would, my makeup person, and I would spend at least half an hour in the makeup trailer, just getting the eyebrows right because it it informed the whole expression and she was a voice <laughs> like this <laughs> you know so it was <laughs> the eyebrows were incredibly important um uh so, and i love costume fittings mm. and i love that process and and you know and, and the shoes and all of that stuff i i love it i love going to costume houses and looking at all the costumes I'm, i've always been a costume junkie um, so yes, an incredibly important part of the process. And um, but <coughs> the more important part is the inside-out part. You can't have the one without the other no. at all. Um, and I don't know. I'm a great believer in. I know um, Americans. In, in my experience with American actors, who I absolutely respect so much and if we have time I'll tell you a story why but um, I think they are fantastic and I've always looked at American actors as my inspiration um, as I say with Bruce what are you doing <laughs> how do you do that and I can't see you do it it's driving me crazy you know and and, uh, and I've just really found inspiration with American actors um, but I've noticed in read-throughs you know, uh, a, a reading of a script, the first read through or something, that Ameri a lot of American actors just won't engage at all. They, in audition, I know you do, you guys go in and you give it, you do it. Um, but for some reason, on a read through, so many actors just mumble it and that you can't really hear what they're saying and, and they won't seem afraid of, com they seem afraid of committing. I love the first read through. I said, go for it, you know, because your instinct is working. You've never read it before. I've, I'm very lazy. I hardly ever read a script before I go to a first read through. <laughs> so, I, because I want that fresh, how, how, how does it come from nowhere, you know? I want that coming from nowhere moment, um, which will never happen again, because now you're in the process. So, I love that. and, and um, I, I go hell for leather on, on <laughs> first read-throughs. <laughs> so tell us your story about American actors. I think we have to hear that. Yes, I, I did a play called Month in the Country um, a long time ago. And I did the play in England. It was a four-hour play, long play. And um, all the English actors going, oh, it's such a long play. How are we going to learn our <laughs> lines? We have to learn our lines. I don't know how I'm going to learn my lines, you know. Um, so we would work from... Um, no, uh, 10 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon and then we'd have the afternoon off to learn our lines um, and we get on and then we're the first run th you know first we're on in tech and two or three of the, the actors still don't really know their lines they're still stumbling so eventually they get there by the first night thank god they get there but I come to do the same play in America completely different cast completely different production I'm the only one who knows their lines because I've done it before, but it's a completely new cast of American characters, uh, uh, actors, sorry. At the end, we had four weeks rehearsal. At the end of the second week, they were all completely off the book now. I mean, solid off the book. They'd done their work. And it blew my mind. And it revealed to me an element in American actors, their, just their commitment, to their profession, their passion, uh, their dedication. And I, I was just so touched and amazed and moved by that. And, and um, it, it affirmed something <laughs> that I kind of knew. Or I'd only seen them on screen and been blown away by, by their naturalism, you know. Um, and, and now I saw this other side of that naturalism, which was the hard work side of it, the, the passion and the commitment. America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, we have a question from Kelsey Hewlett. Uh, wants to know the most, sorry, oh, way back there. <laughs> wants to know Kelsey. the most emotionally challenging role of your career and why. P.S. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, mm. uh, you know, the, you, you have emotional scenes often in, in, in films. Um, but the consistently emotional thing, I can't, you know, I can't really think of any one particular um, film. Um, ironically, I did a film called Calendar Girls um, a while ago. <laughs> it was, the film wasn't emotionally demanding. It was fun and I was with uh, great actresses. But at that time, my brother, who I hadn't seen for a long time, was dying of cancer in the Philippines. And he didn't have any money, and he had problems with, and he was in denial, and it was skin cancer, and they don't have skin cancer in the Philippines, so nobody really knew what it was, and he kept going in for operations. And anyway, it was, so every morning, at, uh, you know, at, at five in the morning, I was on the phone either to him or to his doctors and trying to sort things out. And then I'd go on the set and have to do this comedy, <laughs> you know. So, you know, that was, that was emotionally challenging. And, and, um, and actually then after Calendar Girls, but I, I had to repress it because I had to carry on and do my job. Um, uh, but after that, I did a film called The Pledge um, oh, and uh, with Robert Redford. And, and I had just one breakdown scene at the end of that film. Um, and it was funny, everything that I'd repressed doing mm. the Calendar Girls, when I came to do that s breakdown scene, I did literally break down because um, I... I'd held it in mm -hmm. for so long, and finally there was, you know, there was a moment which was rare, <laughs> tailor-made to have a cathartic moment, if you like, and it just all came out. It was, it was very um, disturbing, yeah. actually. Yeah. Was it therapeutic, or was it? I think it was, yes. It was, it was tough. It was, um, I think it was, probably, yeah. Uh, and what's up next for you? Uh, well, uh, I have a, a lovely, f uh, a really interesting film, which I hope you'll all go and see, called Eye in the Sky, that is oh, coming. Yes, um, I've heard about this. Coming, to, it's being released in March, I think. It's about drone warfare. Really good movie about drone warfare, about all the issues involved in the political decisions, um, and, and so relevant to to you know, what we're experiencing in warfare at the moment. And, and it's a fun, really good movie, really good movie. Um, and I'm going to do a film with Will Smith next. Oh, my God. God. <laughs> yes. He's the best. He's the best, yes. yes. What's that one? Is he your love interest? Please oh, say yes. I wish. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> <laughs> Would love that. Those days are past, I'm I afraid. don't know about that. <laughs> No, 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 not at all. I won't, I won't tell you the story because it's, you know, it's a good story. But it's called Collateral Beauty. Yeah. Oh, who's the director? Good question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're married to a good director. What's he doing? Yeah. <laughs> yes, he, yes. Well, I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, Thank you. you guys for being a great audience.